From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Sportsline. Hey there, Sportsline on your television. Steve Lehman here with you. Glad you are here with us on this Monday night on News Channel 5 Plus. We're going to go through the brackets tonight. We will get your phone calls, 737-7767. Who are some of the teams you liked? Who are some of the teams that you don't like in this tournament? What do you think about the local teams? Vanderbilt's heading up to be in a first four game tomorrow night in Dayton against Wichita State. How about the Commodores' chances against the Shockers or perhaps to pull some more Shockers in this tournament and keep on advancing? Austin P, the 16 seed in the South, will take on number one overall seed Kansas in Des Moines Thursday afternoon. Never seen a 16 versus one upset. Any chance in your mind that Austin P is going to change that on Thursday afternoon? And how about Middle Tennessee, perhaps underseeded in my mind, and I think a lot of other people's, with a 15 seed. And that means a very difficult draw against the team, I think, from the beginning of the year anyway, was my pick to win the national championship at Michigan State. The Spartans are the number two seed in the Midwest. That game will be Friday afternoon in St. Louis, and you can catch it over on the mothership, as I like to call it, News Channel 5, in spectacular high definition. Other thoughts about the bracket, we can get into those. I, I certainly have some. 737-7767 is the phone number tonight. Also, the NCAA Women's Tournament bracket came out just uh, about an hour or so ago, officially unveiled all 64 teams on the women's side of things. It's been an up and down year for Tennessee, but the Lady Vols do make it back to the tournament. They are still the only team ever to make every single one of the NCAA women's tournaments. So great news for them. They are back in, but they've got the lowest seed they've ever had. They are a seven seed. They are in the Sioux Falls region. They will take on 10 seed Green Bay. That'll be Friday afternoon, about 4 o'clock. They're in Tempe, Arizona. So if they win, they likely have to face the host in two seed Arizona State in round two. So a difficult assignment for the Lady Vols if they want to advance. The other interesting note, if you're a Lady Vols fan and you're looking ahead, believing this team is going to figure it out and that they're going to beat Green Bay and that they're going to beat Arizona State and they're going to move on to Sioux Falls and be in the region, the regional finals. South Carolina is the one seed in the Sioux Falls region. So potentially a team that's been a real problem for Tennessee over the last couple of years could be the roadblock getting in front of them. Of course, I think at this point, if Holly Warlick gets to that roadblock, even if she loses, she'd be pretty happy after the way this season has gone for the Lady Vols. Two other local teams to talk about in the NCAA women's bracket. Middle Tennessee back once again. Conference USA champions again. What a program they have down there with Rick Insel guiding the ship for the Blue Raiders. Conference USA champs are a 12 seed. I think fairly well respected in that regard. And they will take on five seed Florida State. That'll be Saturday afternoon, College Station, Texas, part of the Dallas region. So Middle Tennessee with an opportunity. Who knows? We always like those 12 versus five upsets, maybe. That's exactly what Middle Tennessee can do. They've been a fixture in the tournament, but it's been a little while since they've made a run and won a game in the tournament. So maybe they can turn that around this year. And then how about Belmont? Back in the tournament for the first time since 2007, just the second time the Bruins have ever been in the NCAA tournament. Cameron Neubauer's team getting a 13 seed. So pretty good respect for the OVC champions as well. The Bruins also get an added benefit of the only top four seed in the tournament, I believe, that, that I saw anyway, that was unable to host first and second round games. That's Michigan State. So Michigan State is the four seed opposite Belmont. But there's a conflict of some sort in East Lansing this weekend, which didn't allow the Spartans to host, which means the five seed, Mississippi State, will be the host for that region. So Belmont will go to Starkville, Mississippi this weekend. 
and they will take on Michigan State. So, yeah, they've got a four seed, but I think some people thought Belmont wouldn't be as high as a 13, so you got to like that seed. And then secondly, you don't even have to play on the opponent's home floor. So very good news for Cameron Neubauer's crew. Maybe they can pull an upset in the NCAA tournament and prolong their season. They've won, I believe, 16 of their last 17 games. So they're certainly hot at the right time going into March. Your thoughts on all these brackets, men's side, women's side, whatever you saw from the past couple of days, 737-7767 is the number tonight. We would love to hear from you on the program. I will tell you one thing. After looking at the men's bracket yesterday when it came out and today during the day, I think the entire NCAA Tournament Selection Committee should be fired. They just should be fired. This was as poor of a bracket as I have seen them come up with in quite some time. And I'm a little bit of a bracketologist, I guess, in my spare time. I like to mess around with it. And I've done it for, for several years. This is a new hobby. I mean, 16, 17 years of going through and following the procedures and protocols that get, they go up with and you see if you can come up with a bracket to project and get an idea where teams might go, where you might be headed, etc. And, and also just see how you do compared to the committee at the end of the day. And historically, I think if you do that and you pay much attention to it and you do it w with any regularity, you kind of get the gist of what they're looking for. You follow the rules and the procedures. And it, it's not that difficult to get most of the field right. You, you see a lot of the bracketologists, the true bracketologists like Joe Lenardi and Jerry Palm, people like that, they oftentimes get 67 or all 68 teams right in the field. I, I would say in my past it's usually 66, 67. A few times it's been all 68. I got 64 right yesterday. I don't have any problem with that because it's not going anywhere and I don't have problems telling you guys that. The only thing is I think the committee miss the four teams and not me because there are just some inexcusable omissions and inclusions in this bracket. St. Bonaventure was in everybody's bracket. There are, there are really 59 recognized brackets out there that people go to uh, that have done it for quite some time and people recognize, look at it all the time. St. Bonaventure's was in 52 of the 59 brackets. Somehow the committee doesn't have them in. I had St. Bonaventure on the 10 line, and they were, I'd say, six or seven teams into my bracket. And somehow they don't get into the tournament, according to the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee. There were several other teams like that. I mean, St. Mary's had 27 wins. I think the most egregious one was Monmouth with 27 wins. King Rice, former Vanderbilt assistant, did a great job there. They had a bunch of high major wins, and they got no credit for it. And I'll come back and hit on them in a second because I think that's another important point. But they had a big gripe here for sure. San Diego State, Mountain West Conference champion. That is a difficult league to go 16-2 and two in, which is what they did. All the travel uh, that you have to do out there, it's difficult. A lot of one night off, play again traveling far different distances in the Mountain West Conference. They navigated it well, just lost in the conference championship game. They don't get in. And then the final four teams in, uh, I know Vanderbilt fans are happy, but Vanderbilt's in, and, and frankly, fairly significantly in. They were the fourth to last team in the field. And to me, when you looked at it, I, I debated Vanderbilt as the last team in my field. I ended up with them as the second team out, and, and I think that's kind of where they were for everybody. The belief was if Vanderbilt gets in, that's not, a, that's not a terrible inclusion. They're right on the cutoff there. But if they get in, they're one or two teams into the field. If they're out, they're one or two teams out of the field. So how does the committee wind up with them four teams in? Wichita State's fine inclusion. I'm okay with that in the first four. But then the other first four game is Michigan – and Tulsa, Michigan went 4-12 and 12 against the top 100 this year. 4-12. and 12. That's not the NCAA tournament field or the elite teams. That's the top 100. They went 4-12. and 12. Tulsa 
has literally four decent wins on their schedule all year. Three of them are at home. And in all four cases, they lost the second time they played the team they beat. Tulsa was so far out, you talk about all the brackets they were recognized. There's 59 of them. You throw my bracket in, that would be 60, because I know what I had. So 60 brackets that I know of people who look at this and try to project these things and, and follow all the guidelines that the NCAA Tournament Committee gives and try to come up with the best they can. Tulsa, you want to know how many they were in of those 60 brackets or the 59 that are, are recognized? You want to know how many they were in? Zero. They were in zero brackets, yet somehow a committee of 12 put them in the field. How does that happen? I just don't get it other than the committee has gotten too formulaic over the years. They've relied too much on the RPI and some of these metrics that you get and not enough on some of the advanced metrics that are out there now that you can compare some of these things. I don't think they recognize the wins the way they should because the RPI skews this and they look at the the rankings of these things and they say okay so and so team has four wins against the top 25 that proves that they're a great team well we'll look at every other factor and if you're comparing let's say Tulsa who has these four wins they're like top 70 wins they have four wins against the top 70 that's why they're in the field well Monmouth basically has four wins against the top 70 and you know how many fewer chances Monmouth had to go out and do that than Tulsa did a lot fewer and it's so much more difficult to do it if you're one of those smaller schools and yesterday what happened is the committee basically said we're taking the big schools we're taking Syracuse we're taking Michigan we're taking Vanderbilt we're taking those teams and you little guy Valparaiso Monmouth sorry you're not in you're not good enough and I think that's a bad precedent to set and I will tell you why and specifically get into Monmouth when we come back on the other side of this break. Also tonight, we'll have my interviews from last night right after the selection show with Vanderbilt coach Kevin Stallings, Middle Tennessee coach Kermit Davis, and Austin P coach Dave Luce. All three local coaches in the NCAA tournament preparing for games this week. We will have those conversations coming up on the program. We will perhaps hear from some other players about their selection in the NCAA tournament. And we want your phone calls as well. 737-7767 is our number. Stay tuned. We will get to you right after that here on Sportsline on News Channel 5+. Plus.